So now looking at it from the rear three quarter view, this is where a few of the questions start to pop up. In 2021, luxury British coach builder Rolls Royce stunned the automotive industry when they revealed the boat tail, which at $28 million was the most expensive car ever put into production. And that was until last week. Somehow, Rolls-Royce have released another jaw-dropping exercise in opulence with the new Amethyst Drop Tail, priced at a figure of over $30 million. Is the combination of unparalleled aesthetics and, of course, that attention to detail enough to justify its exorbitant price tag? Is it the Drop Tail's abundance of intricacy and technology? that elevates it to the zenith of luxury or is it richness in price tag alone? Let's take a closer look. Now the first three things that jump out at me on first impression are that grill. There's something about it that I can't really put my finger on, but it just has something that doesn't tell me perfection. The next thing are the headlights. Are they too simple? They're modern, but do they have enough character? And then the roof. There's something very odd going on here where it just doesn't look like the roof and the glass match each other. It seems to be a mismatch. But overall, on first impression, it is a Rolls Royce. Nothing has that kind of presence on the road, almost an architectural presence. It definitely has a sense of gravitas that only a Rolls Royce could have. Now let's have a look at the front, the side, and the rear in a little bit more detail. Now diving into a bit more detail on that front view, as we know, Rolls Royce has always had a very majestic, a very proud, a very upright, a very architectural, almost Parthenon style grill. It has the typical elements of that very bold, very striking upper side of the grill, and then the blades that support it that are very vertical in this sense here. But maybe it's just because I'm a, a detail freak to the extreme, but what I can't get over on a car of this magnitude, of this price, why the spacing isn't absolutely nailed on the grill. You might be asking me where. Well, just check out that center spacing here. And you'll see that that middle spacing, if you're OCD, it's gonna tee you off to no end. Every other rib is seemingly equally spaced, but when you come down to the middle, it looks pinched. And again, for me, that just doesn't feel right. An additional thing that makes this Rolls-Royce grill really a standout for them is that slight tweak it doesn't look like a lot but it does achieve quite a nice effect is the fact that the ribs going up and then they have that just slight chamfer that slight angle off the top part of it coming back in giving it a slight overbite to that larger part of the frame of the grill so that in effect is something that looks a little bit different from rolls royce but does carry a lot of weight with it does carry a lot of visual power to it, visual effect, and uh, I think it's a very, very nicely done piece of design. Apart from that, yes, definitely a modern upgraded version, a little bit more elegant, a little bit more lith, but still very Rolls Royce. Now the next element I wanna talk about are the headlights. The headlights are kind of like the eyes, the, the eyes to the soul as we call it, but on a car like this, do they express uniqueness? Do they express the overall character of the car? But in my opinion, they're a little bit too squinty for a car of this size. Doesn't reveal a lot of character. And I'm wondering what kind of technology they're using because as you see here, the running lamp or the daytime running lamp as we call it, is just a very small linear, horizontally linear light. and perhaps that's about as minimal as you can get to express any type of character in one of the functions of the headlight. Now there is one feature line, one gap on this car that I really appreciate. I think it's quite expensive to actually produce in this way, but it's a Rolls Royce. 
and that is bringing the fender line up and over to this feature line going through the bonnet, the hood area here, and that is where they place the cut line for the hood, for the bonnet. Now that means one big massive fender, quite expensive to produce in terms of tooling and getting it accurate in terms of quality and fit and finish, but they do it and it just simplifies and cleans up the whole area, doesn't break it up into too many visual parts. It looks a little bit more uh, volumetric or a little bit more massive and more behemoth in a certain way. So the outline of the fender would actually come down from the front door shut line back behind there. And then probably I would estimate coming through here, down through here, and then becoming the top edge of the bumper shut line. So in side view, you'd be able to appreciate it a lot more. But like I said earlier, typically you would bring the fender up to a point like that or perhaps even if you were doing what we call a clamshell, the hood would extend all the way across like that and perhaps finish here on the side somewhere. But that massive fender coming through there is a pretty big piece of tooling. And so is it a Rolls Royce from the front view? I would have to say it is because it does come across again, very, very architectural a certain way, but still designed with a lot of sensitivity to the surface. Few details, of course, but every car has some quirks and this one no less. Maybe that's what makes it such an art piece, artsy piece of automotive sculpture. Automotive sculpture. Automotive sculpture. Automotive sculpture. Automotive sculpture. Automotive sculpture. Now from a side view, this is definitely something new for Rolls-Royce. I recognize it as a Rolls-Royce, but it is a little bit of an evolutionary approach to their design language. Let me explain. First of all, we have this type of design in the front, which gives you that sort of no bumper uh, feel to short overhang, no bumper type of feel to the front of the car. And again, very few cut lines. You can see that the only cut line that you're gonna see on the fender in this view actually is right here where the bumper split is through there. And then you come all the way back, a large expanse of front fender all the way back to this line right here. And then of course you've got the typical Rolls Royce, almost refrigerator or vault like door handles. You got a very, very large door on it, which is of the suicide type, which opens towards traffic as we say. And that could be something that makes the car Uniquely Rolls-Royce, not a lot of companies out there are allowed to actually even have permission to do that. Rolls-Royce does. We move to the back and you start to see ever so slightly the reason why they call it a drop tail. Before we get to that drop tail, I wanna bring out one feature that I really like. It's almost a newer interpretation of surfacing on the side of a car. Not a lot of cars do it in this way. They typically do it in the opposite way. But on the Rolls-Royce here, they brought something in a new type of light catcher or a new type of surfacing to the light catcher area, which is basically opening it up to the front and tapering it as it goes back. I can't exactly explain why they stop it here, what happens in this area here until we actually see it in real life, but there is some kind of new expression, new design language going on in the surfacing of this area here, even for a Rolls Royce. What I find interesting on here as well is that from here forward, I recognize the Rolls Royce from the rear shut line of the door backwards. I would never be able to tell you this was a Rolls Royce if it didn't have some kind of RR badge on it. Why you might ask? Well, what other car have you ever seen that has very, very similar architecture to this? Probably none. Good reason, there's a few things on this design here that I would almost use the word convoluted because if you look at it, which we will do in a second from the rear three quarter, there's things going on there which sort of jive. They don't seem to go with the cleanliness, this absolute elegance that we have going across this expanse here. In the back, especially on top, you'll start to see things that almost get a little bit too busy, a little bit over the top, at least in my opinion, because I think this is the elegance of the car. This is something that they've tried to actually emphasize why the car is gonna be this expensive or why it has such a high price. 
And obviously the detail back there is I would say the justification to this, to this vehicle's price. Now there is something on the door handle that I'm not a big fan of. And of course, when we're looking at something that is that big, that grabs your eye, that becomes a talking point piece of design, it better have a reason. And I can almost guarantee you, this is probably the easiest opening and closing door in the automotive kingdom. Why put something on that is so clunky, so heavy looking? I would much, much prefer to have a door that basically welcomes you by opening on its own, either by a remote control or a function on the fob that you might have. Anything except something that relates to industrial design, to product design. The handle is in no way elegant on this car, and I think it deserves to have, or at least exude, huge amounts of elegance. The door handle and whatever feature this is here in front of the door handle, I don't think that that heaviness, that, that chunkiness suits the overall intent of this car. The wheels, they do look like they work with this car. Obviously, they have to be very large wheels. They're probably a minimum, I would say, of 22 inch on this car, probably even maybe a 23 inch, but very simple, very geometrically designed, goes well with the overall feeling of the front end and of the side of the car. Nothing too fancy, nothing, let's say, breaking new ground, but just working well with the sort of triangular themes, I think, that we can see through certain areas of the car. You can see that, you can see that. It does work, it looks like they tried to keep the theme of the body style in mind when they worked on the wheel design. Now, as we move to the rear of the car, you can start to see some strange things for Rolls-Royce happening. You can see this coming like that. You can see the window here, open glazed area. Something else that resembles almost another window coming in this area here. A dropping rear deck line, a line coming through the shoulder that just hints at dropping through there. And then something quite angular here in the back and then another little bit of piece of a bumper coming down here. We'll have to look at that from a rear three quarter to start to appreciate a little bit more. But definitely the taillights look very fresh, very different from Rolls Royce. Hint of elegance with their little RR logo on this side. And I'm curious because the other side must be the side unless they've airbrushed it out where they fuel up the car. And I'd like to look at that detail too because a lot of times not a lot of attention is paid to simple elements like fuel flaps. So let's see what they've got on the other side as well. And what we're looking at here is a rear three quarter of the right side of the vehicle where normally you would have the fuel flap. And as you can see, it's been airbrushed out. In reality, this is what it looks like and no wonder they've airbrushed it out. And the reason why it's bad is because it doesn't even look like it was meant to be in that spot. And they've had to compromise it by eliminating part of that round fuel cap just to make it fit in that area. Total compromise shouldn't be done that way, I would say. Now, another thing besides the door handle that takes up a lot of visual attraction, a lot of your, your energy looking at, is the front door shut line, which comes in through like that. And you can see it has a very distinctive rearward lean to it. Now, not a lot of cars have that, and that's for the certain reason that this one can have it. It's because of that suicide door opening system, which allows you to hinge it from here. And this line here then therefore means that it can actually swing out and not dig into the side of the car if you were opening it in this manner. So that very distinctive door shut line right there makes you know that you're looking at a Rolls Royce with a very special door opening system. So now looking at it from the rear three quarter view, this is where a few of the questions start to pop up. No doubt that this car has presence again from the rear. Very distinctive look from the rear again. Is it a Rolls Royce? Mm, I've never seen a Rolls Royce rear end like this, but it's a drop tail. It's supposed to look different and it certainly does. I would say that the designer probably didn't design it this way. It just happened through engineering. For me, a bit of a compromise because in a car like this, we want a zero compromise. It must absolutely be perfect. And one issue that I'll point out 
I don't know if you'll agree with me, but I certainly, I have OCD, so I have to admit it. Look at this area through here. The way the roof section comes down and then has almost a different curvature to the glass. You can see this amount of offset happening through there. That is not, let's call it normal or optimal. And I'm sure that in the design phase, the designer would have intended these two surfaces, the roof and the glass, to have followed the same amount of what we call barrel curvature. Barrel curvature being in two directions. It doesn't do that, so it looks like the roof isn't made to fit exactly and properly and flush to the glass area. Shouldn't be better, I would say. Then you have a glass line through here, which again, is very unique, very characterful for this car. Does it work? Well, it is a little bit of that triangular sort of effect that they're bringing in through different elements. Okay, no harm intended, no harm done. The corner of the glass, we can see how it actually sits inboard, how the roof corner actually protrudes or extends outwards from that area there, a bit like an overhanging ledge. In reality, I'm not sure that's gonna look great, but it is what it is. Then if we look at the tail lights, for example, they're not, let's call it very strong in communicating the design feature. They're there, but kind of inconsequential, a bit too almost timid. I would expect that a car like this, even though the Rolls Royces tend to have overall smaller than you would expect tail lights, on this one, they're almost so small, I would say that from a rear view at night, you're not really gonna be able to tell that this is a Rolls Royce when you look at it from behind. Might be that at night it gives off a jewel-like character to it, something very special that we're not seeing here. I would hope so. Again, a very, very expensively tooled rear fender on the car. You can see that the split line comes through here, through here, through here. Probably all this piece here is fender coming in through here. Now that is quite a large fender to produce and you would expect that to be mounted with exquisite quality control. So kudos to Rolls-Royce for being able to produce something. Of course, it's probably hand built, but still very impressive to see that kind of metal uh, produced in such a way that it looks almost like it's hewn out of a single piece of, of metal, if that's what they're using. The wood here, obviously very interesting, very, very expensive. I'm sure uh, probably split in the middle, looks like it with this type of grain coming through here. I read, I'm not absolutely sure, that has some kind of aerodynamic testing done on it to make sure that it works with the vehicle. That kind of testing that, that we typically use to make sure that all parts of the car uh, perform optimally uh, and correct for the aerodynamics. I do like the surfacing on this vehicle here. It has that sort of change or bevel in that area here, comes down very elegantly, creates the wheel arch ellipse through there. Again, very smooth surfacing through here, sharp angle change that does give it quite a bit of character. A lot like what they're doing on the front of the car, so that does bring it in tune or at least in harmony with the design of the front end. Too often times we have cars that just don't relate front and back. And this car, with that amount of design going on, on that surface does break away from what's happening in the front, but below that line, slightly below the belt line, we do have something that looks pretty congruous, pretty relatable to the front end design of the car. So overall, from the rear view, where most of the evolution and most of the revolution is happening, I definitely wouldn't say that it looks like a Rolls Royce, albeit in a much more modern way, perhaps, or much more different way, but in a car like this, you probably prefer to be unique rather than too in alignment with the current design language that Rolls-Royce has been using for many years now. So it does stand out on its own, albeit some of those details can be questioned, can be criticized, can be critiqued in a way that perhaps there are other ways of doing it that might be better, might not be better, yet it's all uh, subjective, I think, in that sense. I'm just touching briefly on the interior of the Rolls-Royce, not a heck of a lot to say to it. Not because it's not interesting, but simply because Rolls-Royce does not make hardly any mistakes 
on the interior, I say hardly, of course. Very happy to see that we don't have a massive display screen here. Just very nice to see that Rolls-Royce have kept it in the realm of elegance and not high-tech digital. Not that we're against digital, of course, but in a car like this, I think it's about elegance and this just absolutely whispers elegance. There is one thing that really disturbs me on the interior of the car. Again, it's just a detail thing, and I repeat, it's probably just my OCD, but if you're gonna have that kind of diagonal element to the wood grain, especially coming down the middle of the car where they take such extreme care to match the grain in a V-like pattern, why would you not carry that V-like wood grain pattern through the center? And you can see here, they haven't done it through the middle section coming off this part that's near the armrest, as well as going through this area here and down in there. There is no V-type grain alignment. That, again, would throw me off a little bit, and perhaps it's something that, as it's quite dominant, quite visible on the rear deck, you would want that as a theme to run through the rest of the car. Now, one other thing that I'm really happy that Rolls-Royce has stuck to has not gone in the directions of current trends is the way they present their gauges, their instruments, the way they actually make them look like high precision uh, analog pieces for measurement. And that is something that I think they should never lose. Rolls-Royce is all about being hand-built, handmade, analog, attention to detail. Definitely the look of their analog gauges is supreme, probably the best in the business. And I think that any owner of a car like this would most appreciate this type of look as they've done it on their vehicles. <laughs> Regrettably, the Rolls-Royce drop tail fails to fully justify its astronomical price point from a critical design perspective. While it undoubtedly carries the cachet of the Rolls-Royce brand, its conservative design, impracticality, and its relative lack of technological innovation make it less compelling compared to some of its competitors. For buyers seeking a balance between opulence and innovation, I think there are more worthy options available in the ultra luxury automotive market. However, if you were the buyer of this car, you could care less what anybody else thinks about it because for you, this is your ruling art sculpture done by Picasso, done by Rembrandt, done by, uh, what's that guy that squirts paint everywhere? Jackson Pollock, thank you. And you don't need to ask people what they think about it. You are in love with this product. It is yours. You are the only one who owns it. And for that reason, and only for that reason, this car could be even worth 50, $100 million dollars and nobody should question that because it is what you want and what you can and are willing to pay for. As always, let me know in the comments below what you think. Is it just getting out of hand now? Where is that limit? Or is it fun to see these kind of works of art just coming out every couple of years or so and costing an arm and a leg? On the other hand, if you're looking for a car that pushes the boundaries of technology and of innovation, I'm afraid you're not going to find that here. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.